from 2014, Mr. Speaker. As the Attorney General said, we've been trying to pass insolvency legislation, insolvency of bankruptcy legislation, Mr. Speaker. And it took a lot of discussion, Mr. Speaker, because truth is we are being pressured by international financial institutions to remodel and re-engineer the rules that govern us, Mr. Speaker. And truth is, we have, on several occasions, have had to have what is called conditions precedent to receive um, funding from international organizations, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, the problem is, when we come to this Honorable House, we say one thing, and when we go out, we say a completely different thing, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we passed a health and security levy, and we said clearly it was to raise revenue, Mr. Speaker. The, the health and security levy, at its best, will raise $33 million. At its, at its best, $43 million. It has only raised, when we passed it, the last fiscal year, $8 million. The expenses on health and security is $243 million and climbing. The health and security levy, Mr. Speaker, we said it very clearly that it was a measure to raise revenue because the country in its budget, and we said so several times in the budget, we'd gone for two public policy loans. The same way when we, we had taken another public policy loan, there was, a, there was an increase of $1.50 on gasoline to increase revenue. But suddenly, Mr. Speaker, the one fifth, the, the two and a half percent was sold as if it was money, it was separate money, all in a sudden, calling people liar and a kind of speaker, because money is different, you know? So to raise revenue, I mean, it is when you really think about it, Mr. Speaker, it is something that I've chosen, because you know, the idea is to take us off focus, to take us off focus, Mr. Speaker. When, you, when money goes into consolidated fund, it doesn't go into the consolidated fund and you see it goes there for health and security. It goes to the consolidated fund and there's an allocation for health and security. We never put the money in a black box. The only time when money goes in a particular place is when you proclaim that's in a black box. When I came here and I passed, we asked members to support the 2.5%, we said it was going into the consolidated fund. But suddenly, even though we said that we had to raise revenue, the argument was, oh, you said 2.5% was not to get a loan. But we said that part of the conditions of the loan was to raise revenue. So how you raise revenue, if you raise it by 2.5%, if you raise it by increasing income tax, if you raise it by 150 on gas, you have to raise revenue. We didn't say it went specifically into a black box. I was asked that before. I was asked that. I said, no, it will go into the constituted fund. But a whole you don't cry, a whole, because you know, the idea is to use fancy words to to put you off focus. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm saying all that to come to the insolvency bill, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, institutions, World Bank, IMF, CDB, have always asked for laws as it relates to insolvency in the country. When I, was, when I had the pleasure to sit in the cabinet of the member for FIFA South, and we discussed it, I made one singular point that you have to protect a, a person's household, a house, their residence, where they raise their family. I made that point consistently and persistently, 
all the time. Even in that legislation, when we, I, mean, I want to just more to me to congratulate and to thank the people in the NCPC for the work that they have done as far as this legislation is concerned, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have many competent public servants, very competent public servants. And you know, public servants will tell you that this Minister of Finance never pretends that he knows more than them. Never. What I do, I have meetings with them, I ask them for, I give them the government's policy, and they give me their opinions, and I come to a judgment based on the policy of the government. I never pretend to know more than them, or never tell them it's not their business and let me run the country. That's how I operate. When it comes to crime, I talk to the professionals, listen to what they say, and I take action. When it comes to St. Jude Hospital, we form a committee, listen to the professionals, and we take action. So in terms of the insolvency bill, we had discussions, Mr. Speaker, for years. I think they've made the NCPC, they've presented the cabinet probably twice, I'm sure of twice, possibly more times than that, Mr. Speaker. The drafter who worked on that bill, Mr. Speaker, he's spoken to the cabinet three times to guide us as to which way that we were going. And I always said to him all the time, we need to protect the house where somebody raises their family, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, this act is an act that was needed, is an act that the government had the courage because the, the idea started, Mr. Speaker, and, Dr. and the member for, for Beaufort South always speaks about courage, Mr. Speaker. So in 2014, when that discussion started, Mr. Speaker, it started in 2014 and we lost in 2016. And these, were, these years must be put in proper context, Mr. Speaker. 2014, we lost in 2016, we won again 2021, and we have the courage to bring it to Parliament in 2024. And that, and that is crucial and important, because that is how our policies flow, Mr. Speaker. So when all the diversions come, and Mr. Speaker, I have not already had my say in many things, you know. I've allowed this thing to go along, people talk and slander me, and I haven't had my say in many of these things, because, you know, I have a job to do. My job is to remain focused. I have a job to do. So I don't get carried away with all the things that have been said, Mr. Speaker. So 2014, Dr. Member for Vifort Sov as Prime Minister, we have, we, had the, we have the discussion. I mean, Mr. Speaker, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong Mr. Member for Vifort Sov, wasn't it, wasn't it our government that set up the NCPC? Yeah, our government, yeah. Under the, the guidance of a contractor, Renault. Mr. Reno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the idea, and you know, when I leave Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book, Mr. Speaker. Because too much of St. Lucia's history and too much of facts, Reno was the one who was chairman. And that came under us because, Mr. Speaker, when you talk about governments that say about the private sector, it was under our government with a guy called, um, what's his name, Agent Oje. We set up the private council, set up, remember the private council and they attacked us for? When, when we set up the, 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 private, the private sector, office of private sector relations, Mr. Speaker, because we were always interested in bringing the private sector on board to help in the governance of this country. It was under us, Mr. Speaker, that we passed the, we dealt with money, um, marketing for small hotels. We called it STEP. The, the office was upstairs, the Ministry of Tourism, in the corner where the entrance is, Mr. Speaker, right now. If you're going to Ministry of Tourism now, on that side, we had a STEP office, marketing for small hotels. 
Because under this government, Mr. Speaker, most of the incentives for the private sector came under the Labour Party government when in government. Most of them, if not all, including now the, the largest tax am amnesty ever in this country. So, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> when the history would be written, it would be shown that a government that has always protected the people, but also left elbow room and created the environment for the growth of the private sector is the government of the Senusha Labour Party, regardless of what is said, Mr. Speaker. We have never, this Prime Minister, has never gone to any chamber meeting and chastised members of the chamber or members of the Hotel and Tourism Association. Never. They may not like me, because I am no big star. But we've never chastised them. We've always listened to them. We've always discussed with them. We've always said to them, give us your opinion, and we'll come to a logical conclusion, Mr. Speaker. So this insolvency bill is the result of endless consultation. Consultation from 2014, Bar Association, Bank Association, Credit Unions. We, we spoke to everybody, Mr. Speaker. The World Bank, the World Bank helped, helped to fund it. The CDB. Only last week they were here asking about where are we, Mr. Speaker. So, fact is, truth is, if we need to progress and if we need to continue to get funding from these organizations, we have to modernize our legislative agenda. And part of modernizing our legislative agenda is things like the credit reporting bill, the insolvency bill, the revision of the Banking Act. That is part of the revision of our private public sector relations, Mr. Speaker. So this is part of that revision. Talking about countries, Mr. Speaker, we speak about countries. In terms of where we are, where countries are concerned, are concerned it is called the Multi-Vulnerability Index, the MVI. And only last month, the United Nations recognized that you could not judge these islands as regular countries as regular countries because of the impact of hurricanes and climate events on these islands so there's a new measure apart from national income called the multi vulnerability index so the, what the leader of the opposition was, was referring to as far as hurricanes are concerned all these were taken in consideration not only by the force majeure but by the multi vulnerability index that to be used to measure the vulnerability of these islands. So when you negotiate loans, these loans should be negotiated using M MVI as a measure instead of national income. So all these things have been take are taken into consideration, Mr. Speaker. But more specifically, Mr. Speaker, the insolvency, the insolvency bill, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we, right now, right now, Mr. Speaker, the Insolvency Act that we hope that we get approval from, the, from, the, from the, this Honorable House to pass, Mr. Speaker, will create a situation where a few things will happen. We will modernize the credit sector in the country. We will modernize the relationship between creditors and debtors. Right now, the relationship is almost like it's just helka stelka. Help is sometimes it's who you know. Sometimes it's who you know. Sometimes people get bricks because of who they are. That's a fact. Sometimes the banks will have a lot of patience because of who the person is. What that will do is this legislation, Mr. Speaker, will modernize the entire environment. So that when someone, a business or, or an individual is under pressure, Mr. Speaker, he will be able to go and speak to his creditor and say that I am under pressure. Let us talk to each other in, in the form of a consumer proposal, Mr. Speaker. But there are two types of consumer proposals. 
a general proposal and a consumer proposal, Mr. Speaker. And the consumer proposal is a proposal that will deal with what I want to call regular people. That is, people who owe $400,000 and less, or less on their, on, their, on their homes, and people who have debts of less than $250,000. These are going to be handled on the, the consumer proposal, Mr. Speaker. And that is where the protection comes. In that if you owe the bank $400,000 or less on your primary residence, where you raise your family, Mr. Speaker, then you can, you can enter into a consumer proposal with the bank and you can speak to the bank and they can together you can come to a solution or help find a solution to save your $400,000 house or less. Very important, extremely important, Mr. Speaker, because what we dealt with, we're dealing with the regular civil servant who borrows $500,000 to build his house, who borrows $600,000 to build his house, and he's paid two hundred, hundred thousand dollars $100,000, and he's left $400,000 less to pay, and he runs into difficulty. So if added that, We've added to that the fact that if you have a medical problem, because many people have sudden medical problems, Mr. Speaker. You, you've lost your job, you've lost your job. So we've added that as a special condition of protection in that insolvency act. Completely different to if there is COVID or if there's a hurricane. Completely different. Completely different. The whole world changed after COVID. The entire world changed. The entire world changed after COVID. Every country made adjustments for COVID. A completely different, two different things. What's important is we, have, we are saying to people and we are saying to the creditors, let us talk together, one to each other, and come up with solutions. And in, the in terms of the $400,000 for your house and the medical expenses, it will be almost impossible to get your house taken away from you. Almost impossible, Mr. Speaker. And that is why there is so much detail in this loan, Mr. Speaker. Almost impossible. Almost impossible. And further, if, Mr. Speaker, you owe more than $400,000, and then you, got, you get your house sold by the bank, this law is saying that the bank will have to give you some money back so you can start your life again. Again, extremely important. And it doesn't take, and that takes into consideration the regular circumstance and not the extraordinary circumstance of a hurricane or COVID, etc. It's, it's a circumstance where you've lost your, 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 your house, so you say to the bank in this arrangement that the bank, if they've sold your house, they'll give you something back so you can start your life again, Mr. Speaker, based on where were you. And that is what the member said, Akashi was saying. He said that several times, properties that were owned, that you, that, that worth hundreds and thousands of dollars were sold for nothing, and the consumer got nothing back. What's happening now is if the bank sells that house, the law will say that they must give you something back when that house is sold. Completely different. To if there's a hurricane or if there's and. Further, Mr. Speaker, that arrangement is going to be supervised by a trustee or a, or, or a supervisor. As to the way that that, that person is, is appointed, Mr. Speaker, I think in the, in the transitional, in the trans, transitional, um, the transitional areas, page one, page, it, it is, it is clear, Mr. Speaker, on page 268 of the Acts, it is clear as to how these people are. 268, Mr. Speaker, you will see yeah, how these people are, are appointed, etc., Mr. Speaker, and what qualifications they must have. And further, qualifications of, of a trustee is clear as to who the trustee can be and who the, and the qualification of the trustee and also 
it says that the priority of payment, Mr. Speaker, which again is extremely important, who comes first, second, and third in the priority of payment, Mr. Speaker, when a sale takes place? Mr. Speaker, what I think is important is that the public gets educated. And I want to urge the NCPC to continue that education, Mr. Speaker, so the public can know. Many times when a bank calls on you, you get so afraid. And you know, he who feels it most knows it, Mr. Speaker. He who feels it most knows it. Many of us do not know the trauma of when a bank calls on you to tell you pay up. Many of us haven't, we haven't gone through that, 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 you know, so we don't understand the importance of protecting people when the bank calls on them, Mr. Speaker. What we saying for, what? What? What the bank, when the bank calls on Mr. Speaker, what we say to the public, when the bank calls on you, you go and speak to them. And we want to amend the law to say, the bank, the bank must give you 21 days when, you, when they call you to go speak to them. Because many people, when the bank calls them, they get, they get petrified, Mr. Speaker. They get petrified. So this, this act will say to, 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 to the, the consumer, you have protection under this act. Go speak to, to, to the bank. And the supervisor or the trustee will be a kind of check and balance on you so that the, 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 the proposal can have terms and conditions that can benefit both the credit and the debtor, Mr. Speaker. So this legislation, Mr. Speaker, is necessary. It's very necessary because it will determine our relationship with the financial institutions internally and globally. World Bank, CDB, IMF, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we, can, we understand that many of these laws are the, the, plain, the plain field is not equal. The goalpost shifts all the time. Shifts all the time. They block the shift for something, remove it the other time, etc. They shift all the time, Mr. Speaker. So what's important is when we are making utterances that will go in the public domain, we must be less selfish, we must be less self-centered, we must be less take my toys and go, and understand how our words can impact negatively on the international situation. Because we are small countries, very small countries. We are many states, Mr. Speaker. And these larger countries, these larger, these larger institutions, they have almost a grip on us. And it's irresponsible when we make statements that we know, that we know will hurt the country. We know very well these statements will hurt the country. But we make them because we believe that these statements will give us political, political gain, true or false. Yeah. And Mr. Speaker, and you know, I know the business of, of opposition is not easy. I've been there. And when I was there, it wasn't easy at all. And it wasn't easy not because you were not in government, you know. It wasn't because of the way they treated you, Mr. Speaker. That's why it was, Mr. Speaker. I remember being said in this honorable house, I was sitting right there, look at you, so long in politics, what you have to show. I remember that. And I carried that as a badge of honor. You understand, Mr. Speaker? So, Mr. Speaker, so I think that right now, where we are in this world, if we intend to, if we have good intentions for this country, we should understand that not all politics is local. Local politics has international repercussions, Mr. Speaker. And I know countries where governments had to put foreign, had to put US dollars in planes and carried to Miami to pay the debt. 
I know these countries. I know these countries, Mr. Speaker. So that is why it is very important that we don't respond. You say something, I say something. You do this, I say that. Yes, I, and I'm not getting involved in that. I'm not getting involved in that. Because I have a high ideal. The ideal is not about me becoming prime minister. This, this prime minister job is a temporary job. You here one day, you're not there. And every day I say as prime minister, I remember I will not be prime minister all my life. And I, and I behave like that. Because this job wasn't given to me by my father. It was given to me by the people of Cassius East and the support of the people in this house. So I will never deliberately say anything or do anything because I'm not prime minister to bring or join with anybody whose purpose, whose personal purpose is to derail this country because I'm not prime minister. Never. Because, Mr. Speaker, when I go, and when all of us go, the country will remain and the country will have to be governed. It have to be administered when all of us leave, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the, uh, the Attorney General and again to thank the people of the NCPC. Because this is Legislation that shows courage is legislation that shows commitment, is legislation that shows that the government has the guts, the fortitude to make a change in something that needed to be changed for a long time. That was recognized in 2014 by the member for, for, for Viewport South. And right now, it's come full full circle, and it's a government that he had the honor to lead, we are the ones who are going to be passing that legislation, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very proud of the men and women in this cabinet who had the fortitude and the guts to stand up and say, we have to pass it. But while she passing it, we have to protect the consumer. We have to protect the house, the home of the individual, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the education of this bill has just begun. There are going to be changes in the regulations. We're going to mix it. We have some very firm regulations, Mr. Speaker. Regulations, very concise regulations, so that everyone can know what percentage of the money they'll get back, what is the, what is the description of uh, illness. We're going to ensure that the regulations, we strengthen the clauses of this bill so we can have clarity as to what the creditor can accept as to what the debtor can accept, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to say to honorable members that the member for Chosel, I think his, the most important part of his contribution is we haven't heard the last of that bill. And he knows what he's talking about. Because he knows. What is said here is not going to be what is said outside. And what is said here is not how, is not how it's going to be translated outside, Mr. Speaker. Because outside, because outside is to get votes. Outside is to slander. Outside is to misinform outside is to have cheap shots, Mr. Speaker. So that's the most important, and I'm very happy that he said so, because he made me, he, he just reinforced what I was saying for the whole day. I told my colleagues, wait and see. I told them, wait and see. Because, Mr. Speaker, it's a matter of not being able to help yourself. Mr. Speaker, just before I go, one thing. Do you know, Mr. Speaker, and that's all I'm going to say. Every passport in this country is given by the immigration department, you know what? I, I, I just want to tell the public that every passport in this country is given by the immigration department. Every passport. There is not one passport in this country 
that's not given by the immigration department. So everybody, every immigration officer in the building and courts knows how many passports were issued in this country. Not a secret. Not a secret. Every passport. When the, when the commissioner of police gave her review, the assistant commissioner selling passports to police in the country, she said clearly, the commissioner of police, and if you go back and, and play the tape, you know what she said. But you will believe that there is some way they just give passports, 56,000 passports. And, and, and Mrs. Speaker, I, you know, Mrs. Speaker, I sit down and I hear this thing. I hear and I see big men and women repeat these things, Mr. Speaker. And you know what I say? I pray for forgiveness for these people. I seriously. Because, I mean, every passport in this country is given the immigration department. Every passport. They, hasn't got, they have not no quota of passports. That is, look, you give this. Every passport. <coughs> there is, and before passport is issued, you get a citizenship certificate. And then you can get your NIC money, your NIC number. That's the process. So the NIC, so if there were 56,000 passports, how many NIC numbers they would have? Fifty-six thousand passports. So it's supposed to have fifty-six thousand NIC numbers. Everybody NIC. You don't have to get an NIC number. A clerk give it to you. A clerk. You bring your certificate, and they, you fill a form, and a clerk give you an NIC number. A little card. A clerk give it to you. So you mean tell me all these clerks inside there would not know that there were fifty-six thousand passports given? And you repeat that, and people believe that, and slander people in that? 56,000 passports? And you multiplied by, how much you multiplied by? Hundreds and say, 2.1 billion dollars. Come on. Anyhow, this is because I promise, on this thing, my position remains clear. There's a matter in court let the court decide. That's correct. My position And you can say whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You can cause anybody to write whatever you want. My position remains clear. There is a court matter. Let the court decide on the matter. Tell the people the truth. Tell the people so, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, Mr. Speaker, absolute, absolute misinformation. Passports are not allocated. I just said every person has an NIC number. So when you do a CIP program, you don't get an Member for Miku South, if you wish to intervene, you shall rise on a point of order, elucidation. But that's not that's not intervening. Not intervening. No, it doesn't mean be. What, what, what does it mean? It's playing to the gallery. You know, we taught him, we taught him how to hack in Parliament. But he doesn't have the skill or the technique or the information to hack. If you want to learn to hack, let's show you how to hack. <coughs> we are kings of heckling. <coughs> so we're not giving you. So, so what, what are you trying to do? <coughs> what? <coughs> what he's trying to do? He's trying to out deliver us. We are the masters. <coughs> That's why when you. <coughs> That's why when we decide to, to put people on the streets, we put 10, 12,000 people on the streets. And when. And if you want to see street power again, we'll show you power on the streets. That's our scene. We are part of people, we are part of a Labour Party. That's what we made of our politics is street politics. Our politics is the politics of debate, of conversation. That's our party. We are masters at that. Nobody can beat us in that. That's our politics. That is why I'm confident. That's why I'm not, re I'm not re replying to all them things. By the way, on the 28th of September, I'll be speak speaking to St. Lucians in New York.
Huh? The Sunday, Saturday. You have to speak next week. Yeah, let <coughs> On the 29th, I'll be speaking with solutions in New York with this week. Huh? Yeah, 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 you come in? They, they didn't invite you, I invite you. I invite you now. <coughs> huh? <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, on the 29th of September, I'm going to be in New York speaking to St. Lucian's, Mr. Speaker. And then we will discuss issues as they relate to St. Lucia. I can assure you there will be no slander. I can assure you there will be no mention of people's children. I can assure you there will be absolutely no character assassination. What we're going to do in New York is we're going to speak to the people of the diaspora. Of the diaspora. We're going to tell them how, what we're doing to have the second generation citizenship, how that is going. We're going to tell them how we intend to have a special incentive regime for them when they want to come back to, to invent solutions. That's what we're going to tell them. There's going to be absolutely no character assassination. There's not going to be absolutely no name calling. Not in this nation, Mr. Speaker. Because we know, even though, and I said to members of my side, I want them to read a book called The Ministry of Truth. I asked them to read, oh, Miss, 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 you want one? I ordered. I mean for you. Look at Mr. Speaker. If you read that book, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Truth, you know, I, I, that's, 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 that's give me a little leeway. You know, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you, and I speak to my colleagues all the time, I can tell you what's the next move. I know the next move. Because it's just it's just working on a, a specific a specific um, game plan. You know, it's a game plan that we've sat and we've put together so you know the next move. You know the next move. You know the next move. It's so transparent, Mr. Speaker, that it doesn't even hurt any longer. Because it's transparent. I mean, I tell, we, we, we speak about it all the time. What's your what's next move? Listen to what the member of the has said. He said, you haven't heard the last of that. I, that's what we said this morning. <laughs> <laughs> because Mr. Speaker is one is and to Mr. Speaker, big in predictable, predictable. So you're going to hear three things before you go. One, that you one of them is you have to try to rewrite history. So you rewrite history. You write things that never happened. Two, you have to get people to say that history for you. The history that you've rewritten. So how, how do you do that? You go on Facebook, you have all kind of blogs, you have all kind of sensational headlines. People are writing a history that people are re, re, recalling the history that never happened. Three, you have to be shameless. <laughs> you must say things and look at straight and say, listen to me, that didn't happen. And you know what happened, shameless. And the fourth thing, Mr. Speaker, in that style is that you must repeat, 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 repeat. Repetition. Say the same thing over and over again. Where's the funds? Where's the funds? WTF? Where's the funds? Physics has a passport. Same thing. Just say it all the time, Mr. Speaker. Now, when you say thing, Mr. Speaker, especially when especially when especially when they're not true but the difference between us the difference between us and them is that the people can relate to us the people can relate to us mr speaker so mr speaker Member, members thank you members 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 thank you very much mr speaker for and thank you to members, Mr. Speaker, for their support, Mr. Speaker. Member for Microsoft, for, please. For the support, Mr. Speaker. Again, let me thank 
the civil servants, let me thank the civil servants, Mr. Speaker, and let us decide. Member for Castro Central, the same applies. Please allow the member for Castro East to continue. Thank members, Mr. Speaker, for supporting this bill. Thank the civil servants for their hard work. And I hope that the creditors and the debtors understand that we are in this thing together. The government will maintain its oversight to ensure that the debtor, particularly the small man, gets his fair chance to restart his life if and when a calamity comes. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.